Hello, Script Apart listeners. My name's Al Horner, back with another episode of this podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies and TV shows. Today on the show, we've got with us the talented Samuel D. Hunter, writer of the moving new drama, The Whale. Directed by Darren Aronofsky, the film tells the tale of Charlie, a reclusive former teacher who developed destructive eating habits following a devastating past tragedy. With seemingly just days to live, Charlie desperately attempts to reconnect with a daughter who resents him and is sinking into a cynicism that Charlie finds heartbreaking. It's a film that you may have heard has stoked a wide range of reactions, which Sam and I get into in detail. We talk about that provocation of a title and how it was designed to prod at people's perceptions and misconceptions before taking on a completely different context in the story. We discuss the challenges and opportunities presented to Sam when it came to adapting his stage play into a screenplay and what the scarcity of media telling the tales of plus-size protagonists does for the fabric of our society. I really enjoyed this conversation. Sam is a wonderful interviewee. I really hope you guys enjoy it too. Okay, one quick thing to mention before we dive in. Script Apart is on Patreon and you can join today to help support the show as me and Cam attempt in 2023 to deliver more episodes more often with really exciting guests. It's just the two of us making Script Apart. There's no big team behind the scenes. So uh, the more of you who sign up to receive exclusive benefits on there, the more we'll be able to do this podcast. If that sounds like something you'd like to get involved in, head to patreon.com forward slash script apart. We really do appreciate your support. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get into it. This is the wonderful Samuel D. Hunter discussing the first draft secrets of The Whale. Thanks so much for tuning in. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Domecq. Hey Samuel, great to meet you. Thank you so much for coming on Script Apart. How's it going today? I'm good. I'm very good. A little jet lag, but I'm good. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so Sam, there is lightness in the whale and and glimpses of joy in this story, which which really moved me. By the way, um, it's ultimately a film about finding faith in each other and the importance of human connection, and all that's pretty hopeful. There are obviously though very heavy elements to this film, and I'm aware that you pulled a lot from your own life to usher this character of Charlie into existence. What's it been like? having this story in the world and, and being summoned to engage in so many conversations about those heavy themes and, and perhaps heavy parts of your life. I, I think at a certain point in my life, I I realized that the kind of uh, stories I wanted to tell were stories that had some, hopefully, utility for people, some like emotional utility or, or dare I say spiritual utility for people. Um, and, uh, and that does result in a lot of like difficult conversations and, and, uh, but you know, I, I have to say that like the most rewarding part of this press tour has just been like hugging a lot of strangers, you know, <laughs> you know, like there, there's just been a really, a lot of like very open hearted conversations that I'm like deeply grateful for. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a story that was like difficult to tell, and and one that that took a lot out of me. But but I'm ultimately glad that I that I did it. You know, absolutely. Well, Sam, I know the stage version of the whale was inspired by a real life classroom situation, kind of similar to the one that we see in the movie, in which you asked your students to write you something honest, something true. One student answered kind of heartbreakingly, that they needed to accept that their life wasn't going to be that exciting. Something about that touched you, and it inspired you to write a play about an adult with a, with a relationship to a young person. You've mentioned elsewhere that there were some false starts en route to the whale while, while trying to find a story in that vein. Can you tell me about some of those false starts and, and what it was that felt right about the whale that felt wrong about those abandoned ideas. Yeah, I mean, you know, as you said, like I was teaching expository writing at the time when and when I, did, you know, had that response from a student that that was so heartbreaking and that that led me to uh, the notion of like writing a, a story about a teacher uh, trying to connect with a young person. And the first false starts were like were like stories about like a teacher and a student, you know, like and and they just felt like a little bit 
a, a bit too intellectual, a bit up in the air, you know, like a little disconnected from my own sort of like emotional life. And, and it wasn't until I realized that like maybe the connection here is deeper than just like a teacher and a student. Maybe it's a, a father and a daughter. Then that that really like uh, concretized the the um, the emotional world for me, you know, um, and it's it's funny now because like working on the the scripts now i'm a father and and uh, i wasn't a father when i when i wrote the original play and so working on the screenplay like i have this like very uh the emotional reality of like trying to connect with the daughter is like much more real to me <laughs> than it was when i first wrote the play so it's I, i'm really grateful that i i got the chance to you know to get another swing at this story all these years later Wow, yeah, I can definitely imagine the added poignancy this story must have taken on after yourself becoming a dad, Sam. Um, when Aronofsky came to you about adapting the play, it sounds like you were initially quite surprised. And uh, that's fair. I mean, The Fountain is the go-to work that I think of when I think of Darren. And there's quite a distance between the scale of that movie spanning centuries and this tale, which pretty much unfolds in one room, right? Um, Darren's a filmmaker who has always seemed to me fascinated by extremities. So extremities of addiction in Requiem for a Dream, extremities of self-sacrifice in The Wrestler. I'd love to hear about, uh, yeah, some of your earliest conversations with him. What you think it was about this story that urged him to fight alongside you for such a long time to get it made? And uh, yeah, what from your perspective it is that kind of ties the whale into the rest of his filmography what you think it was about your storytelling that fits into his i think i mean you you mentioned the wrestler i think that that was one of the movies that that's my favorite film of darren's actually i think it's such a beautiful character study and i think uh i you know i mean, when i mean i should back up a little bit when darren first contacted me i mean i never imagined that any filmmaker would approach me to you know, make this into a movie. I, when I wrote this play, I was just desperately trying to be an off-Broadway playwright, you know? And so like when the play was finally produced in a 125 seat theater uh, in New York, I felt like I had, you know, scaled Mount Everest. It was like, I, I, I did it. This is exactly wh what I've been trying to do. Like, like, um, and, and so when I got that call from Darren saying like, let's talk about this as a film, it was, I was a little blindsided by it. Um, and, uh, very early on in our discussions, I was worried that Darren would want to like open it up in that traditional way of sort of like adding characters and adding flashbacks and things like that. And, and, um, and I, I should say too, that like in that 10 year journey, um, of making this film with Darren, there were other filmmakers that entered the conversation because like, you know, like Darren drifted away from it for a little while and like made mother and, but he still had the rights to it. And so he was trying to set it up with other filmmakers and all these other filmmakers all wanted to open it up and change it. A lot of them wanted to do like rewrites of the script. Um, but Darren was the only one who really uh, all along the way was really interested in keeping it in the apartment, uh, which was something I think like other plays of mine, were they to be opened up into, uh, into films, like you could, open them up in that traditional way and add flashbacks or other characters or other scenes. But there's something about this story that really demands it to just be centered on this guy and in this apartment, like you really can't leave him. Like once you leave him or leave the apartment, then it becomes something different entirely. Um, and, uh, you know, there's something about like going back to the wrestler, there's something about like the way that he so intensely stayed with that guy in the wrestler the entire film i mean like i i, I don't know i'd have to rewatch the film but my like memory of that film is that like we never leave this person like we're just constantly centered on this guy and all these like close-ups you know like of just like being with this guy and when he's in these like very extreme situations um so i think like as I was developing the the story into a screenplay, I had the wrestler in my brain being like, this is like a vocabulary, uh, a visual vocabulary that that uh, Darren is so good at that that I can, 
you know, harken back to as we continue to develop it together. Um, but it's it's weird because we're very different storytellers, Darren and I. Um, I, I, you know, and it's not like the obvious pairing that you would think, like like him and I. Um, but but like our Venn diagrams, I think, kind of like meet very beautifully with a story like this. And you know, all along the way, like we really never disagreed about how to tell the story. You know, and I was on set the entire time working with him very, very closely. And, you know, I, I there were, was really never any disagreement about how the story wanted to be told, you know, um, which was like such a gift to me as a screenwriter. I mean, I really do feel like the, the luckiest writer on earth that that I get as the first experience as a screenwriter that I get to uh, have so much agency in uh, how the story is told. And this is going back a while, but when you cast your mind back to initially writing the play, what was different about your first draft? I know that you like to approach writing first drafts with a certain kind of light footedness that you try and push, push your, yourself as the omnipotent writer, kind of controlling these characters. You try and push that guy out of the way and, and find the story alongside the characters. What did that translate to? in terms of your very first draft of the stage version of this story? What were some of the big changes, if there were any? Oh, gosh. I have to harken back to 12 <laughs> years ago when I was first writing this this draft. I think, I, I, I think like, with any play, you know, I've, I've written probably, like, you know, somewhere around 15 plays since The Whale. And I, I think with any play that I've written, I try to, as you say, like, have a light touch with it because I don't want um like i i don't really outline in a traditional way i mean I, I i sometimes outline as a diagnostic tool after i write a first draft um or, or i should say i routinely outline after i write a first draft as a diagnostic tool but 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 i when i'm writing very in the very very beginning i do try to keep a very light touch because i feel like if my voice shows up as the sort of the author, either in terms of like, uh, you know, a thematic statement or, um, you know, wrangling the characters in terms of plot. I just feel like I then that's an opportunity for the audience to check out because all all of a sudden becomes about me and not the the storytelling. Um, and so I think you know, getting back to your question, I'm thinking back to when I like first wrote the play. I mean, I I I will say that like. Uh, I surprised myself by having uh, Mary, the mother, enter the story. Um, it, originally, this in my head, this was a four-character play. Um, but then when I got, you know, three quarters of the way in, I was like, oh, you know what? <laughs> like, I actually think this, this, the mother would show up, you know, uh, and uh, it provided a new kind of energy, and it destabilized the the play for me in a really effective way. Um, so. But I think, but I also think as a writer, like I, I generally can't start anything until I know what the end is. Um, so I, I knew from the very beginning what the end of this story would be, but I tried as much as possible to sort of like surprise myself along the way, destabilize myself along the way, disrupt myself along the way as I was writing it. So when it came to the rewriting process, did, did that involve fine tuning the dynamics of a lot of conversations you already had mapped out and, and sketched in? Like, for example, the scene you mentioned where, where Mary shows up. I was amazed watching that the first time by, by the emotional arc contained within that interaction. They, they start off on a confrontational note, but over the course of just being in each other's company, through conversation, their, their resentments melt away, they find love. They find compassion, empathy along the way. Did you find uh, that you had kind of a lot of beats mapped out who would talk to who when? And, and then as you kind of got deeper into draft after draft, that was when those dynamics came out, the shifting scales of power and compassion in each conversation. I, I think one of the reasons that I'm really attracted to dramatic writing as opposed to like writing a novel or writing poetry or something like that is I, I love collaborating with people. And so, like, very early in the process, after I have a first draft, I invite people into the process. I invite actors in, and I invite directors and dramaturgs in to to um, uh, to shape the process. And so, like, you know, the whale 
as a play when you know way before there was any talk of it becoming a movie there there was a lot of development you know there was i i developed it at the denver center for performing arts i developed it at um something called play pen in philadelphia uh icicle creek in uh seattle there was a lot of different places that i like uh heard different actors reading it uh and uh, you know explored it in certain ways um so you know and and you know talking about the mary scene specifically i mean that scene got rewritten over and over and over and i think it was like uh the more that i heard actors inhabit the role the more that i was able to find this sort of like different emotional um almost like emotional crevices in the scene you know what i mean because there's so much history that's being excavated between charlie and mary in that scene i mean they haven't seen each other in years they had a kid together they were married there's so much hurt but at the same time there's so much love and so I think that scene, you know, oscillates between um, emotional violence and love kind of on a dime, you know, because because that's real. I mean, I, I mean, this is, you know, real life, like we don't enter into conversations in real life with like, uh, here's our thematic statement for this conversation. You know what I mean? Especially with people like that, that we have a lot of history with. I mean, there's there's a love and hurt living side by side. Um, and so I really like tried to excavate that as much as possible in the in the rewriting process. And was the title always The Whale, Sam? I mean, it, it's it's quite a provocative and multi-layered title for this story. From the outside, you might imagine it's a reference to Charlie's size. You know, like, whale is a derogatory phrase that's thrown at plus-size people, disgustingly. Um, but actually, in The Whale, it refers to the animal in Moby Dick and, and an essay that Ellie wrote as a kid that's that's a vital part of this story. Can you tell me about landing on this this name for the movie and uh, the ways that you could maybe subvert expectations with it? It's it's a phrase usually deployed completely devoid of empathy, but you repurpose it in a way that's that's full of empathy through the role that it plays in in Charlie and Ellie's relationship. Yeah, it was a title I resisted for a really long time, to be honest. I mean, it, I think it was the title that was kind of obvious because of all the Moby Dick references and because that's the sort of secondary title to Moby Dick. Um, but it had a different title for a while. But I, I remember like I it, it was I, I went I was in a writer's group at the time at a theater called Ars Nova in New York. Um, and I brought it in an early draft of it that had a different title. Uh, and uh it was really like my fellow writers who who like pushed me toward something that maybe is a little bit more provocative that does poke at people's prejudices um but i but i don't think of myself as like a provocative writer <laughs> it's a very sincere story and i feel like my my plays are quite sincere um they you know they 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 just want to tell these sort of like emotional stories they're not um you know they they're not they don't have that kind of a Kubrickian distance of sort of like poking at the characters and, you know, like as much as I love Kubrick, but, but you know, uh, and so it was, again, it was something I resisted in the beginning, but at the end I was like, you know what, like people are going to bring so much, uh, baggage to this story when they realize who the main character and I, not everybody, but, but, but a lot, most people will bring a lot of baggage to this. And, you know, as a person who like, years ago lived with a, a much bigger body than I have right now like and I I know acutely what it is to sort of like live in the world as a bigger person and then live in the world as somebody who has the body that I have now and people treat me so much differently now that I have the body that I do now um in a way that was kind of shocking and I mean like like cashiers are nicer to me now like like people it, the the world is a kinder place to me now, which is like a, a really difficult thing to realize. And so I think I eventually embraced the title because I was like, I I think this does need to expose people's prejudices as they're coming in the room. Um, yeah. There's also, of course, like a, a religious connotation to whales, like the story of Jonah in the Bible, that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm really intrigued by by the intersection of Charlie's journey and religion in this movie. The film takes place across almost the course of a week in a kind of reverse creation story. You have characters like Thomas from the New Life Church in the mix, 
And, you know, gluttony is, of course, one of the sort of seven sins. At, at what point in, in writing the play did you realize that religion might be an interesting thing to kind of use as a counterbalance to, to what Charlie's going through in this story? And uh, yeah, what did you hope to express about religion in, in telling the whale? I mean, I've, I, I write about religion frequently. Um, I'm, I'm actually in rehearsals right now in New York for a play called A Bright New Boise, which um, I wrote right after write, writing The Whale. And they're kind of companion pieces. And that that play is about uh, uh, an evangelical who is also trying to reconnect with a, a, a son that he hasn't seen in many, many years. Um, I mean, it, a lot of it comes from my own past. Like I grew up in a small town in Idaho. Uh, and I went to a fundamentalist Christian school. Uh, I'm gay. And at a certain point, I was outed uh, and and had to leave that school. And so I think like, I have a very, com just personally, I have a very complicated relationship with Christianity, because I, I really loved Christianity. Like, I, I found so much value in it. And I actually think like, you know, fundamentally, I think the whale espouses some very Christian values of, of like grace and redemption and forgiveness and uh, empathy and love, you know, uh, which are like the beautiful things about Christianity that I, that I took away from it. But I think my own experience with Christianity was a very complicated one because I was, I loved it and I took so much value from it, but at the same time I was rejected by it. Uh, and I was told that like, there was something fundamental about my personhood that was in opposition to uh to that value system which never made sense to me because i was just i it, it was so difficult especially as sort of like a teenager to negotiate those two things of, of like i i keep praying to like become a different person i keep praying to become a heterosexual person and like it's not working so like how what is this intersection of like my personhood and like spirituality and like what is my sexuality have, even have to do with spirituality it just it, it fundamentally didn't make any sense to me and so i think it's something that i keep exploring in my writing um because i didn't have the experience of, of like wanting to abandon religion uh it was it was something that still felt very like fundamental to me uh and i still think of myself as like a fairly religious person um it's funny actually when we were in uh venice there was a Polish reporter who was interviewing me and she, she said all the Polish reviews say that the play is very, or that the story is very Christian. Uh, and I think Darren was a little shocked by that. Um, but, but I like was really happy about that. Cause I was like, yes, I think this actually does espouse fundamental Christian values. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, there's this conflict, you know, uh, and, and it's, um, yeah, it's just something I, I think I continue to explore in my writing. Um, but uh, but I think like, you know, Thomas comes from a church that is very similar to the one that I came from. And I think there's uh, the, there's that fundamental conflict of like Thomas wanting to save somebody and wanting to offer somebody salvation. But at the end of the day, the thing that Charlie needs Thomas to realize is that his value system exists mm -hmm at the cost of people like him um you know it's a, it's a value system that like it's it's like a brick wall that's created and uh you can only exist behind that brick wall at the cost of the other people who are sort of like living outside um which is you know what i experienced yeah no that that rings true to my experience of the film like it may be kind of critical or my perception of the film was that it is critical of, you know, facets of, of religion and sort of the, the human parts that we kind of instill in religious structures. But love thy neighbor and the, the sort of idea of what happens when you don't have your love from from your neighbors, the tragedy of isolation, as I think you put it elsewhere, like that's that's really what this story was about to me. We should dive into some scenes, Sam. Um, I wanted to ask about sort of where we begin this story. So obviously we have that bus scene that kind of introduces the film, mm. but then we kind of move into our introduction to Charlie and we meet him kind of via a laptop screen initially. We sit in on a teaching tutorial on, well, Zoom or a program like it. Now, one of the squares in the middle is black belonging to Charlie. He blames a broken webcam as the camera begins plunging into the black square like we're plunging into an abyss. And from, from that tease of his shame over his physical appearance, 
we cut really abruptly to Charlie masturbating over gay porn and subsequently having some kind of cardiac episode. It, it's so kind of bold as a beginning and a way of introducing us to that character. Can you tell me why this felt like the right way to introduce Charlie and to bring us into the world of the whale? Yeah, I I mean, it's funny, like, like people have told me like, oh, that scene, they've characterized that scene as like shocking. Uh, but I also think that like, if you began another movie with like a heterosexual guy with a, a smaller body masturbating to straight porn. I mean, that sounds like the beginning of an Adam Sandler movie. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I was going to say American Pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, 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 you know, I, I think one of the reasons I started it like that is because, you know, whatever shock value that happens in that opening scene is entirely upon the viewer. You know, like, uh, like they're the ones that that bring that. Um, that uh lens to that scene you know um but but i think also just like as a storyteller like i didn't you know it's it's like let's not waste any time like let's let's like like let's get into it like at the very beginning like let's you know i i i there's there's an i guess there's another way to start this story which is sort of like charlie sort of casually moving about his life and then we move into the sort of you know i mean you know there's that screenwriting thing that they talk about a lot about like inciting incident and I and I feel like the the normal sort of like um, you know the screening writing like Mad Libs it's sort of like page ten is the inciting incident or whatever and and <laughs> yeah and and I think here it's sort of like why wait like let's 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 get into it you know like uh, this is going to be like a very intense five days for this character and so let's let's start it you know when it matters you know let's let's not waste any time and from there there's a slow drip of information about. Um who Charlie is and why he is the way that he is and um, both physically and emotionally. And, and we get a glimpse at this in, in a very early interaction between Liz and, and Thomas, the kid from the, uh, the New Life Church. Um, believe me, he doesn't want to hear about New Life, says Liz. Why? Because it's caused him a lot of pain. It killed his boyfriend, Liz continues. This really is kind of, you know, what's at the heart of the whale. How did you come back to this backstory about Charlie and um, did, did you begin with his health condition and then work backwards to find the pain that's the source of his his binge eating or how did it work Sam? I think it, it started with backstory it definitely started with backstory I mean it, it, it started with like um, I, I think with any play I, I write it, it kind of begins with backstory because I can't I can't reverse engineer this kind of stuff you know like i like i can't start with given circumstances like that's never really uh made sense to me uh because like it, as people in the world like we are a product of our past and we're a product of um everything that's happened to us and and so like if i if you start with some extreme situation uh then then it's like you're just like filling holes or something like that you know and i and i I, I think it, it it starts to read false. I mean, like, you know, I didn't start this this story when I first started developing. I didn't think that this was a story about somebody who was dealing with obesity. You know, that was something that came out of the character that I was developing. And, and you know, obviously my own personal backstory and uh, the fact that, that I, you know, have a history of self-medicating with food entered into it. But, uh, but no, it was really like... Uh, who is this guy in this small town in Idaho and what brought him to this place, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard. Like, it's almost like I can't divorce backstory from given circumstances because they're, they're, they're so tied up in one another, you know? Um, so when I started developing the character, uh, his history was fundamental to who he was. You know, I love how in the film you're able to kind of physicalize Charlie's pain regarding his his the partner that he lost. You're able to kind of physicalize that in the form of another room that he seldom goes into. That's that's almost like a shrine to his anguish. And um, I'm aware that that wasn't something that was that was in the play. That was something you added to the film. In terms of things that, that you know you you added to the play. There's a little bird that Charlie helps every day and you describe it in your script as a ritual for him. Can you tell me about like the meaning of that motif, Sam? Like whether the bird's a kind of signifier of Charlie's sensitivity and his capacity for giving 
yeah, I'd love to hear about that change and some of the other things that you saw an opportunity to to add to. Yeah, I mean, you know, as a as a first time screenwriter, I think like one of well, I should say like I, I've done some screenwriting in the last ten years, but when I first started developing this as a play, this was like brand. This was or as a screenplay, this it was a brand new thing for me. Screenwriting. Yeah, uh, there were a lot of things that I was like, how can I tell the story visually? How can I develop the character visually? Um, and the the second bedroom was something actually that was a later discovery that was something I think during the pandemic that I that I realized I could do and uh, in the play Charlie has a whole monologue that he delivers to Thomas about his uh, his dead lover Alan uh, and and the circumstances of all of that and it kind of felt like in the movie version, it was like, is there an opportunity to tell the story visually? And so I had that idea for the second bedroom that's that, you know, to your point is sort of like a temple for his anguish uh, and and also sort of like the archaeology of his past with Alan. Um, yeah. And then the bird came in that the bird actually was an early discovery of thinking like, you know, how can I show Charlie's capacity for caring, you know, in this two bedroom apartment, like what would he actually have access to? to um to to show this sort of like fatherly almost affection uh and i think that you know that and then when ellie witnesses that and realizes that and sees that that like he's bestowing this fatherly affection that she has not been receiving for several years that that's like a, a, another source of like anger for her um and then there was also very early on i had the idea for the uh the pizza guy uh and it was actually so early that that darren so right before we went into production darren went to the uh lincoln center performing arts library which uh they record they record a bunch of plays uh on film and uh he watched a archival uh uh recording of the whale that was from 2012 and he came to me and he was like where was the pizza guy and I was like, there wasn't a pizza guy in the play, Taryn. And he was he had been so convinced that the pizza guy was like fundamental to the structure of the of the play. Uh so um it, it was and, and it was a really like a real joy for me too to be able to add these things that like you could never accomplish in a theater. Um so uh but it was it was a long, you know, I think the very first draft of the screenplay was very much kind of the play almost cut and pasted into a screenplay format. I remember when I sent it to Darren, I was like, this isn't right, but this is like a beginning. Um, and from then it was like a very slow methodical process of like figuring out the the cinematic language of this two bedroom, two bedroom apartment. And when we meet Ellie, the film all of a sudden takes on this ticking clock. Like we're watching to find out if Charlie can fix his relationship with Ellie and perhaps repair some of the nihilism in her that she argues he's responsible for. And he has to do this before he dies, in just a matter of days. Who was Ellie to you, Sam? And uh, what did she and Charlie need to do to find a connection and a forgiveness in your mind as you constructed their relationship? I think Ellie for me is almost like that nagging sense of like, you know, Ellie says uh, in one of the key moments in the play, like, you taught me something very early on people are assholes. And I, I think that's kind of the, like the black hole that we all have to stare into now and again, right. Of being like, is, is like, is pain just pain is suffering, just suffering. You know, like I remember during the pandemic, I wrote, I, I read this book called uh, a world led only by fire. Um, that's all about the dark ages. And uh, I think I read it because I wanted to kind of remind myself, like during that very dark time of being isolated and, and feeling like, oh, my God, is the world ending? Like, I wanted to remind myself that like history is very long, you know, <laughs> like like yeah. that, like uh, this is like a, a very like limited period of time. And, and, and like one of the things that really worried me about that book was like it felt like so much suffering throughout history didn't lead to triumph. It didn't lead to success, you know, like, like, like if we're being really honest with ourselves, like a lot of the time suffering just kind of like exists and then just falls into the void. It doesn't, there's no reward. Um, and that's a dark thing to stare down. And I think like Ellie is kind of the embodiment of a character who has kind of ossified in that worldview of just like, 
suffering just kind of exists for its own sake um but charlie is like the antithesis to that of, of being like no yet like yes suffering exists but it's still worthwhile to be a human being and to have faith in other people you know and that's that's the kind of like um that's the kind of brilliance right of being alive of like even though suffering arguably just exists for its own sake that that being alive and trying still matters i mean like like that's the kind of an incredible thing about humanity is like we all still try and we all still like get up in the morning and interact with each other and are kind to one another and and build things and you know i'm getting a little stupidly philosophical now but but like <laughs> like like it's 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 worth being alive yeah you know like amidst the fact that suffering kind of exists for its own sake and i and that's i guess the fundamental tension of the film of, of like of charlie desperately trying to teach that to ellie even as she doesn't want to believe it but maybe 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 in the end she does you know that line about people being assholes that being ellie's belief and the way that she's uh you know conducting herself in the world you withdraw from the rest of humanity when you think everyone else is an asshole and um that, I guess, to go back to that phrase we used earlier, the tragedy of isolation, Charlie is a guy who's lived without human connection for so long, and he desperately doesn't want that for, for his daughter. It's not just a selfish desire to repair that relationship. It seems like he, he recognizes something that primarily he does not want for his daughter, and, and that's kind of part of the, the drive here. We should talk also about Ellie and Thomas's relationship in this film. Um, so Ellie secretly records Thomas confessing to this incredibly painful journey that he's been on with his family and his church. And in some ways, it's a, it's a violation of him, but it results in the one thing that Charlie craves himself, reconnection. Um, Thomas announces he's moving back home after Ellie sent the tape to his former youth group. He sees it, Charlie sees it as a compassionate act. Where did the truth lie for you in terms of Ellie's actions towards Thomas? Like what, what's going on from your perspective in those scenes, Sam? You know, I, I, uh, I'll never say, because <laughs> I think, I think here's the thing. It's sort of like, uh, you know, so many people have asked me that after this movie, like, was that an act of compassion or was that an act of vengeance that Charlie's misinterpreting? And I think the thing of it is, is sort of like, that's a question that like, that you are meant to wrestle with like if 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 i i think land it, it goes back to this sort of like authorial voice that that i'm not i never want to like come in and and say for certain uh what these characters are doing why they're doing it what the thematic statement is you know if i if i came in and i was sort of like okay ellie is definitely trying to help him or ellie is definitely just trying to hurt him i i think that's almost like doing a disservice to the audience because like part of this journey is sort of like if if like you need to to make the leap of faith that charlie makes uh about ellie um or not you know like like or it, it's almost like a it, there are two doors that i'm presenting to the audience and like it's up to you which one you want to walk through um because that's real life right i mean like we don't like real life is gray real life is cloudy like we we don't always totally understand motivation and and understand intent uh, and it's it's kind of up to us, like whether or not we we make that, like I said, leap of faith with her, you know. And what can you tell me about the ending, Sam? I mean, it, it's such a such a special moment. Was there ever like a moment in the whale's evolution where you contemplated giving Charlie a second chance at life? And and if not, why did the story demand that he he die in such a bittersweet way, full of full of triumph as well as tragedy? I mean, I, I think it goes back to what I was saying, sort of that that like you know suffering and joy live side by side you know and and i and i i don't want to write a story that gives like false hope or false redemption but i also don't want to write a story that like just lives in you know darkness and tragedy you know um and and i and i think that the ending is all about like those two things living side by side you know that that uh that triumph is a complicated thing you know i mean it's, it goes back to what i was saying about like suffering doesn't always lead to reward uh even though i do think the end of this this story is like very very hopeful uh like i i don't want to give any false notes about uh or, or false you know platitudes about uh how suffering always leads to triumph 
it's hard as an audience to lose Charlie in that moment, having spent this time with him and, and fallen in love with him in a way, or, or at least kind of garnered a sympathy for him that's, that's quite intense and quite personal. Was it hard on the page as well as you wrote that? Was it, was it a difficult moment given how much of yourself you'd poured into this story? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always really difficult. Like, I don't know, it, it's, but it's complicated. I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it, like he does get what he wants, you know, he, 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 in a, in a way, this is like a hero story uh, and, and, and he does sort of like get the, you know, golden chalice at the end. I mean, he, he does reconnect with his daughter. Um, so, so I think like, I, I, even amidst the sadness and even amidst like uh, how hard it was to write it, I did feel a sense of, you know, joy that, that he was able to sort of like uh, leave the earth the way he wanted to, you know, uh, which like that, you know, hopefully we all get to do that. You know? <laughs> Fingers crossed. Now, um, I had a really powerful reaction to this movie. It, it it hit me on a guttural level that I don't experience often. Um, but like a lot of movies that I adore, and especially have adored this year for some reason, like Babylon, Tar, those kind of films, like there's been a real spectrum of reaction to it, I think it's fair to say. Did you always know from the inception of the play, right the way to the development of the film, that the whale was going to be this Rorschach test of sorts? Like that the challenging nature of this story, and I guess also the scarcity of other media grappling with these themes, this sort of protagonist, that meant it was going to provoke a wealth of different responses. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, like almost all of my plays, you know, have that, to your point, that kind of like Rorschach test of like a very, of like a broad spectrum of, of, uh, of reactions. And I think it's, it's partly, it's going back to that thing that I was saying before about like, I, I, I don't have the, this authorial voice that comes in to say like, this is what it's about. This is what you should feel. This is, you know, like there's no life preservers that I'm, that I'm throwing out there. And so I think for a lot of people that becomes kind of frustrating. I remember I wrote this play, um, uh, which I think is actually one of my strongest plays, uh, called a great wilderness that premiered at Seattle rep in like 20, I think 13, 2014. Uh, and it's a very straightforward play about, uh, a gay conversion therapist and, uh, taking on like his last client. And it's thoroughly a tragedy. I mean, it's, it's about the regrets and, and it's about like kind of a wasted life. Like somebody who was like at the end of his life falling into dementia, realizing <clears throat> what, what exactly he's devoted his life to, but there's no moment, there's no kind of requisite moment where a character dresses him down and says your belief system is terrible and and you've been hurting these young kids and uh like all the characters are fundamentalist christians and so there there would be nobody to um and that angered a lot of people like i i, I there was a lot of like really angry talkbacks where people were like how dare you write a compassionate portrait of this por of this person but for me it was sort of like this is a this is a real person this is a story worth telling like like the person who tried to counsel me out of my sexuality, like he's never going to get a dress down moment. Like he's going to go to his grave believing what he believes and and doing what he does. Um, and so, like I I I have no interest, I guess, in sort of like telling stories that like provide some false narrative about what being a human being is. I mean, like uh, and and he, yeah. So it's it's complicated. I mean, I understand that like like it's a difficult story for some people and, and, but, but it's also like, and, and, but it's also a story that like is real. Like there are people who have this life, yeah. you know, like I lived aspects of this person's life and I, you know, if the character is craving honesty, I mean, like I need to also be honest about, about what the real world is. So you're a North star when you push into kind of like quote unquote controversial territory or perhaps provocative territory is always just what feels truthful rather than worrying about like what feels representational to as large an audience as possible. I think, yeah, that's, that's probably pretty fair. I mean, like it's, it's funny because I never like, I, I never think of myself as like a controversial writer. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> like I kind of feel just like, I'm just telling stories. I'm just like presenting people 
as they are, you know, like I've never, um, you know, I've never written something in order to provoke, you know, like I, 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 uh, and, and I'm always sort of like a little surprised when like on the other end of it, like people do feel provoked by it because I'm, I, I just kind of feel like I'm writing people as I, as I see them in the world, you know, um, honesty to your point. You know? Well, maybe as you say, like the shock is, it's, that's the baggage that other people bring to the text rather than within the text itself. That's exactly right. Yeah. People, people, because there is no like authorial life preserver, people put a lot of their own, um, put a lot of their own stuff on it, yeah. you know, and, and they're always trying to like investigate to see like what my intent is, but like truly my intent is just presenting a person, you know, um, like, like I have no, again, I have no thesis, you know, well, I should let you go and enjoy this sunny day in London, Sam. And uh, yeah, more importantly, celebrate the BAFTA nomination you got last night. Very exciting. Before I do, though, can I ask uh, what you think may be ahead for you in terms of your career, like specifically as a filmmaker? Like uh, you obviously have lots of work for the stage in the pipeline, some of which you've mentioned today, uh, the companion piece of sorts to The Whale, for example. Are there any other projects like that that you'd love to kind of adapt for the screen? now that you've had success with The Whale? Or, uh, yeah, what do you see as next for you in terms of your life as a screenwriter, Sam? Gosh, I mean, I just like, if anybody wants to give me a, a job, like, <laughs> I'll, I'll be happy about it. You know, I, I, I think like, uh, I, I've always um, tried to have kind of like a, a a light touch in terms of like the the direction that my career is going in, you know, because I, I feel like the moment that I'm in the past the moment that i've ever tried to like muscle it to be like i need to be this kind of writer or do this kind of thing it's it's always kind of led me in the wrong direction um so you know i'm just trying to uh you know meet things kind of with a with an open mind and an open heart so i, I mean i would love to continue to do it if anybody wants to to hire me to write their movie let me know <laughs> Well, Sam, this has been so much fun. Thank you so, so much. And again, congratulations on The Whale. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>